So I think the first thing I'd like to bring up is that it's not obvious when considering a matter of this sort what level of analysis is appropriate. If you're reading any given document, you can look at the words or the phrases or the sentences or the complete document, or you can look at the broader context within which it is likely to be interpreted. And when I first encountered Bill C-16 and its surrounding policies, it seemed to me that the appropriate level of analysis was to look at the context of interpretation surrounding the bill, which is what I did when I went and uh, scoured the Ontario Human Rights Commission web pages and examined its policies. I did that because at that point the Department of Justice had clearly indicated on their website in a link that was later taken down that Bill C-16 would be interpreted in within the uh, precedents, policy precedents already established by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. So when I looked on the website I thought well there's broader issues at stake here and I tried to outline some of those broader issues in the initial you may or may not know, I made some videos criticizing Bill C-16 and, and a number of, its, uh, of the policies that surrounding it. And I think the most egregious elements of the policies are that it requires compelled speech. The, uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission explicitly states that refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal pronoun, which is the pronouns that I was objecting to, uh, can be can be interpreted as harassment, and so that's an exp that's explicitly defined in the relevant policies. Um, so I think that's appalling. First of all, because there hasn't been a piece of legislation that requires Canadians to utter a particular form of address that has particular ideological implications before, and I think that it's a line that we shouldn't cross. Um, then I think that the the definition of identity that's enshrined in the surrounding policies is um, ill-defined and poorly thought through and also incorrect. Um, it's incorrect in that identity is not and will never be something that people define subjectively because your identity is something that you actually have to act out in the world as a set of procedural tools which most people learn, and I'm being technical about this, between the ages of two and four. It's a fundamental human reality. It's well recognized by the relevant, say, developmental psychological authorities. And so the idea that identity is something that you define purely subjectively is an idea without status as far as I'm concerned. I also think it's unbelievably dangerous for us to move towards uh, representing a social constructionist view of identity in our legal system the social constructionist view insists that human identity is nothing but a consequence of socialization, which is, which, and, and there's an in, inordinate amount of scientific evidence suggesting that that happens to not be the case. And so the reason that this is being instantiated into law um, is because the people who are promoting that sort of perspective, or at least in part because the people who are promoting that sort of perspective know perfectly well that they've lost the battle completely on scientific grounds. It's implicit in the policies of the Ontario Human Rights Commission that sexual uh, identity, uh, biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, um, sexual proclivity, all vary independently, and that's simply not the case. It's not the case scientifically, it's not the case factually, and it's certainly not something that should be increasingly taught to people in high schools, elementary schools, and junior high schools, which it is, and it is being taught. I included this... Uh, cartoon character that I find particularly reprehensible aimed obviously at it as it is at children somewhere around the age of seven that contains within it the implicit con the implicit claims as a consequence of its graphic mode of expression that these elements of identity are first canonical and second independent and neither of those happen to be the case. I think that uh, the inclusion of gender expression in the bill is something extraordinarily peculiar given that gender expression is not a group and that according to the Ontario Human Rights Commission it deals with things as mundane as how behavior and outward appearance such as dress, hair, makeup, body language and voice which now as far as I can tell uh, open people to charges of hate crime under Bill C-16 if they dare to criticize the manner of someone's dress which seems to me to be an entirely voluntary issue. So. Um, I think that the Ontario Human Rights Commission's 
uh, attitude towards vicarious liability is designed specifically to be punitive in that it makes employers responsible for um, harassment or discrimination, including the failure to use uh, preferred preferred pronouns, they have vicarious liability for that, whether or not they know it's happening, whether or not the harassment was, and whether or not the harassment was intended or unintended. Right. And so I'll stop with that. So what do you have to say about the facts of what's presently in the criminal code and your reflection that somehow uh, the genocide heading the heading on public incitement, on willful promotion of hatred, somehow that these provisions should not be included under those headings. I think I have to be clear. My presentation relates to the amendments of the Human Rights Code or the and proposed amendments. And not to amendment. the Criminal Code? And that is, in fact, how uh, one like Dr. Peterson may, in fact, find themselves on the wrong side of jail. And so if you've, if you've reviewed the, uh, the publication and the opinion, I say that uh, simply by breaching the, uh, the proposed amendment to the uh, to the Human Rights Act, um, and particularly with somebody who is deliberately doing so. For instance, somebody who is saying, "I'm not going to use those words." That person, if they are dragged before the tribunal, the Ontario tri Tribunal or the federal tribunal, mm -hmm. I've indicated to you already that the Department yeah. of Justice yeah. has said they're going to pass the same guideline on pronouns. Mm -hmm. And so, what I'm suggesting to you is that. If somebody says, I'm not going to use those words, are brought before the tribunal, the federal tribunal, and the tribunal then delivers uh, an order for a payment of a fine and alternatively mm -hmm. a non-monetary remedy, i.e. cease and desist order, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, an order to do something, to compel them to do mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. and that person who's brought before the tribunal says, I'm not doing that, they will find themselves in contempt of court and prison is the likely uh, uh, outcome of that process until they purge the contempt. That's what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting to you that uh, that the uh, amendments to the criminal code. Um, well, I'm, I'm not advocating genocide. I guess let's just say that. And my my presentation here is is restricted to what I see as the pronoun policy issue and the compelled speech issue. So it covers the provincial legislation that you did strongly disagree with that we've had in place in the provinces for decades in some cases. It is the policies that were enacted after it left the legislature and which will be enacted after this bill leaves this, uh, this committee. I would also like to add to that the fact that once I made the video stating that I wouldn't use the Z and Zer pronouns, for example, which I regard as part of an ideological linguistic vanguard, the university lawyers, after carefully considering what I said, sent me two letters to cease and desist in my public utterances because they believed that not only was I violating the university's standards of conduct, but that I was also violating the relevant provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Therefore, as far as I could tell, vindicating the statement that I made when I made the video to begin with, which was that the act of making the video itself was probably already illegal. And they didn't do that lightly. Under so, provincial law? Yes. Senator Platt. However, Dr. Peterson, can you comment on the notion of respect where some of your critics say, why can you not just respect your students, just use the gender neutral pronouns? How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, I'd have to be convinced that doing so would do more good than harm, and I don't believe that. And I, I think I'm actually in a reasonable position to, to to justify my claim, I think that the danger that's intrinsic to the law far outweighs whatever potential benefit it might produce, especially given that there's no hard evidence whatsoever for any benefit. I, I would also like to point out that the people who are promoting this legislation claim to be acting on the behalf, behalf say, of the transgendered community, but they were not not elected nor appointed to act as such representatives and are doing it on their own say-so. I've received many letters, at least 30 now, from transgendered individuals indicating that the, they are not in accordance with the, the claims of these so-called representatives to be representing or with the intent of the legislation, which has actually made them more visible rather than less visible, which is, and the less visible is what they had preferred. With regards to respect is that you don't meet people, generally speaking, in a mutual display of respect. You generally meet people in a 
mutual display of alert neutrality, which is the appropriate way to begin an interaction with someone because respect is something that you earn as a consequence of reciprocal interactions with, with, that are dependent on something like reputation, which is also a consequence of repeated interactions. And so the notion that addressing someone by their um, self-defined self-identity is necessarily an indication of basic human respect for them, I think is an entirely spurious argument, especially given that there's no evidence that moving the language in a compelled manner in this direction is going to have any beneficial effect. We're supposed to assume that just because hypothetically the intent is positive that the outcome will be positive and any social scientist worth his or her salt knows perfectly well that that's rarely the case. I would like uh, either one or both of you to comment on uh, whether you could explain why an individual may have a strong objection to undertaking such a training. Well, I have a profound objection to, to undergoing such training. In fact, I would flatly refuse under all conditions to undergo it. And the reason, there's multiple reasons for that. The first reason is that the science surrounding the uh, the, the, the so-called charge of implicit bias that's associated with perception is by no means settled in, 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 to such a degree that to one of the three people who designed the most commonly used measure, which is the implicit association test, has detached himself from the other two uh, researchers on the grounds that the use of the test has become, has far transcended its scientific validity and reliability. It's nowhere near valid or reliable enough to be used in the manner that it's been using. And even the more uh, pro-IAT researchers who developed the test have admitted to that publicly even though they haven't stressed it nearly to the degree they should have. So first of all, the science is, is not settled and is being used absolutely inappropriately. And I can say that as a clinician because I know the, and as a psychometrician, I know the criteria for using a test for essentially diagnostic purposes and the IAT doesn't even come close to what's necessary. And then the next issue is well, where's the evidence that, that anti-unconscious bias training works? There's no evidence, and what little evidence there is suggests that it actually has the opposite effect because people don't like being brought in front of a re-education committee and having their fundamental perceptions, you see, their perceptions, not even their thoughts, but their perceptions themselves, altered by collective fiat. It's an unbelievable... You there, sir. <coughs> I'm just arguing, sir, that you always base whatever you say on what the Ontario Human Rights Commission is saying, and I'm quoting from the Ontario Human Rights Commission document. They're saying, we're not manda mandating pronouns. You can always use the person's chosen name as a respectful approach. I respectfully <laughs> disagree, but... Then, well, I would say then that's actually an indication of just exactly how poorly the policy documents are written because I can quote this one, which, which is also from the Ontario Human Rights Commission website, that says, and I quote, Refu refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal, uh, proper personal pronoun counts, constitutes gender-based harassment. And so if, there, if the policies were written in a coherent manner and there wasn't internal contradictions, then your statement would be a reasonable objection. But since it's not written that way, and I do believe firmly that that's a testament to the, to the degree to which it's a poorly written set of policies, is that it's full of internal contradictions. And that'll be worked out very painfully within the confines of people's private lives. And if you could please tell our committee more about this issue. It's something that I was not at all familiar with prior to this bill. Um, being introduced, and in particular about the gender-neutral pronouns and your experience in pushing back against being forced to use those gender-neutral pro gender -neutral pronouns. Well, I don't think the people who initiated this legislation ever expected that there would be an absolute explosion of, of identities, first of all, and also of, of so-called personal pronouns, as there has been. I think Facebook now recognizes something like 71 separate gender identity categories, each of which in principle is associated with its own set of pronouns. And so it's become, well, linguistically, un it's, it's become a parody, essentially. It's become linguistically unmanageable. And it's also the case that words can't be introduced into the language by fiat. I don't, I, I can't even think of a time when that's actually worked. We're not exactly sure how words enter the common parlance, but it's certainly not that way. And so the, the, the legislation devolves into a kind of of, of absurdity, as far as I can tell. I mean, one of the people that I discussed this with claimed that the way that you kept track of someone's personal pronouns was to use your cell phone as an adjunct to your communication. And I mean, that's, 
you wouldn't say anything like that if you knew anything about common human nature, let's say, and the manner in which people communicate with one another. Okay, so, so the types of pronouns you're talking about, just so everyone's clear, because I don't think these are com common parlance, um, Z and Zer and what other sorts of gender neutral pronouns are we discussing here? Well, I have a very bad memory for that sort of thing, but if you're interested in it, you can find lists of them very rapidly on the web, and, and they've been produced by, I think, they've been produced by people whose essential desire is to gain linguistic control. That's, that's, that's as simple as I can put it, is to gain linguistic control. But they're not used popularly. And, and that seems to me to be a, it, it's a real problem as a consequence that you make failure to make their use something that, that could carry a criminal penalty. So I just don't understand that. And, and I don't understand how the government can justify imposing a criminal penalty on the use of words that no one either knows or uses. It, it just seems preposterous to me, but okay. there it is. Could you please also tell us a little bit more about the, your personal experience in pushing back against this? And I mean, many are familiar with your story, but uh, not everyone, so I just want to give you a little well, bit of Well, I made a video, actually I made three videos, but we'll just talk about one of them. I, I, I made one criticizing Bill C-16 for the reasons that I already described, because I went and read the policies, and I, they made my hair stand on end, the surrounding policies. And uh, so I made a video stating essentially that and detailed out my reasons. And, um, you know, I've been following the, the battle of, let's say, ideologies on campus for a very long period of time, and I, I suppose I have some expertise in that. And there's, a, there's an ideological war that's ripping the campuses apart, uh, and it's essentially between a an ideological variant that's rooted in what's come to be known as postmodernism with kind of a neo-Marxist base and, and modern, modernism, I would say. And that, that's accounting for all the turmoil on the campuses and I see this as an extension of this campus turmoil into the broader world and, and I really believe that is the proper level of analysis. I truly believe that. And so I said that I believe that this is the, a vanguard issue in a kind of ideological war and that I'm not going to participate on the side of the people whose, whose ideological stance I find reprehensible, unforgivable and reprehensible, especially the Marxist element of it. And so I announced that I wasn't going to use these words because I don't believe that they're instantiated to protect anyone's rights. I believe they're, that the, the, the ideologues who are pushing this movement are using unsuspecting and sometimes complicit members of the so-called transgender community to push their ideological vanguard forward, and I firmly believe that. So I'm not participating in that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's potentially illegal for me not to participate in that is something that I regard as, I think that's absolutely dreadful. It, it's, it, make, it puts a shudder in my heart as a Canadian that we could even possibly be in a situation like that. You know, if, if, the, if the identity claims that are instantiated in, this leg in the policy surrounding this legislation are applied, it's going to be hell for the psychiatrists, excuse my language. It's going to be very difficult for the biologists and the psychiatrists next. And I think we'll see that happening very soon. If I turn to you and say, look, please call me they, because that's how I see myself now. Because it's hurtful for you to call me sir um, or miss, whatever, whatever it would be. Uh, but you refuse. And I say, well, okay, if you're uncomfortable with that because you're not comfortable with that, call me Mark, and you refuse. Were you to continue to call me by the name that I'm telling you is hurtful to me? Is that not, in fact, something that, is that not something that, that, that the law can properly address? This is, you are knowingly hurting me. Uh, and, and in that respect, um, our courts ultimately, I think, are capable of striking a proper balance between people who slip up or who, for whatever reasons, just can't get the words out of their mouth, and those that persist and intentionally causing humanity to respond. Would you agree with my characterization? Very briefly, sir. Well, so I, I would say that the very idea that calling someone uh, a term that they didn't choose causes them such irreparable harm that legal remedies should be sought um, rather than regarding it as a form of impoliteness, that legal remedies should, should be sought, including potential violation of the hate speech codes, 
is an indication of just how deeply the culture of victimization has sunk into our society. Ask one more. Um, again, Mr. Barron, you, you spoke about the chilling effects of overly broad legislation. I'm wondering if you consider the terms gender identity and gender expression to be equally broad, or do you consider one broader than the other? <laughs> With regards to the chill, it's already the case, and I've seen this among my own students when they're teaching personality, which is what I teach, which also involves uh, assessment of gender differences between men and women, that the proclivity now is for the advanced PhD students to avoid any such discussions in their classrooms because the potential cost of transgressing against a, an unknown norm, let's say, is so high that it's just easier to teach other things. And so I've seen that clearly and with multiple people. And I would also say that it's no trivial matter that the Department of Justice's link to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and their statements about how this legislation was going to be interpreted mysteriously disappeared in the middle of December. Of all the things that have happened to me, uh, happened in relationship to this uh, that I've been studying, I think that was the most chilling. It's like, because it was the, it was the, what would you say, it was the smoking pistol, right? Because the issue is what's the right level of analysis? Are you just supposed to look at the legislation? Well, since the Justice Department said, no, you're supposed to look at the surrounding policies, well, that's what I did, and that's what I based my case on. And then all of a sudden, the link to those, the link tying those two things together just vanished, and people had to go into the internet archives to, to, to fish it back out so that it could remain part of the public record. I think that's absolutely scandalous. So how would you describe <coughs> what you're saying, which is your opinion, uh, which you are absolutely entitled to, with what everyone is saying, plus the feelings and testimonies of the people who have suffered uh, over 30 years, who've been taking issues to court. These are people who, be, who, li who we've listened to. So how would you describe this? Okay, well, with regards to your second point, if the people that you're listening to aren't randomly selected from a population, then their opinions are worthless from the perspective of, of testimony because you don't know if you're dealing with a biased sample. And that's a big problem with the public consultation process that underlied this bill. And, and you can not appreciate that if you'd like, but it's standard practice in any, in any polling institution or any body that's attempting to extract a genuine opinion out of a so-called community of people. And if that isn't followed, then you can't tell if the information that you're, that you're receiving is biased. And this, with regards to your first point, what exactly are all those people who aren't thinking the same way as me say? You said that there's a bunch of them and a bunch of groups, but you never said what they're saying precisely. Well, I'm, I think our chair would rule me out of order if I proceed no, you're to, fine. to read out what they're all saying. But in general, they say they oppose discrimination and harassment because of gender identity and gender expression. And then there's three pages, which I can share with you. I oppose discrimination against gender identity and gender expression. That's not the point. The point is the specifics of the legislation that surrounds it and the insistence that people will have to, be, have to use compelled speech. That's what I'm objecting to. I've dealt with all sorts of people in my life, very people who don't fit in in all sorts of different ways. I'm not a discriminatory person. There's 500 hours of my teaching to my classrooms on tape on YouTube and nobody's found a smoking pistol. I'm not a discriminatory individual, but I think this legislation is reprehensible and I do not believe for a moment that it will do what it intends to do. I also don't think that my opinion deviates substantially from the bodies that you're describing because you haven't provided any evidence that they say anything other than discrimination is a bad thing. And I think that unreasonable discrimination is a bad thing. And it's unreasonable when people are judged for any reason other than the specific competence that they bring to, say, a given position. It's not in anyone's best interest that that occurs. But I don't think that you've demonstrated in the least that the opinions that I'm putting forward are exist in opposition to the standard practices, of, say, of my particular discipline. So. Could you, re may I follow? Mm -hmm. Could you repeat one more time your response to Senators Gold and Pratt that the Ontario Human Rights Commission has provided what I would say reasonable alternatives uh, to your, your uh, objection to using pronouns? Well, I, I think it's been made clear in the, in the presentation so far is that it depends on which part of the Ontario Human Rights Commission's policies you read. And that's a big problem. I mean, that's that, one of the reasons I criticized this to begin with was because when I went through the policies, I could see that they're absolutely incoherent. 
So for example, here, let me give you another example. So there's an insistence in the Ontario Human Rights Commission that sexual preference is an immutable phenomenon, which indicates, at least in principle, that it's biologically grounded. But on the same, by the same token, in exactly the same policies, they presume that sexual identity, gender identity, and gender expression are entirely independent. It's like, sorry guys, you can't have both of those because one's A and one's not A and you can't put those together. And like, there's, there's endless numbers of places in the policy uh, surround, surrounding Bill C-16 that are characterized by that kind of logical incoherency. And I mean, what's it going to do to people who are transgender who are making the claim that they were, say, born that way at birth, which is a strong claim. That's a biological claim. It indicates that there's a direct causal connection between some biological phenomena and the expression of a particular identity. It's actually the strongest defense that people who have, let's call them non-standard sexual identities or gender identities, have to defend their okay. claims. I have to wrap it up there. And Are there studies or statistics about the consequences that this bill would have on those people? Is this bill, would this bill save as many lives and help as many people as it says? Well, in, in principle, we would have that information if the policies that have already been introduced by the provincial governments were assessed properly. But as far as I know, there's been no, no studies indicating that the introduction of this legislation specifically has done anything to modify the, the unfortunate rates of, of suicide, depression, anxiety, and so forth that are, that are characteristic well, you could say often of marginalized groups, but that's a bit of an overstatement. So no, I don't, that, that, that was part of my original claim is that there's no evidence that this sort of um, legal redress, let's say, is going to produce any of the positive consequences that are intended. And I do believe that by making the issue, let's say, painfully visible, that's one way of thinking about it, that's actually had the opposite effect. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very common. And, and this is something that's, that's well known in, in the relevant social sciences that just because you intend something to happen when you make a large scale transformation doesn't indicate in any manner that that's going to be the outcome. I mean, it would be lovely if things were that simple. And I mean, the best social scientists always insist that you build an outcome analysis into any, in, into any broad scale, what would you call, uh, uh, social intervention because there's a good chance it'll backfire there's a high chance it'll backfire. So it's all presupposition. And it's, it's based at least in part on the notion that the transgender community is a community and that there are voices that speak for them homogeneously and that this is what they all want and that it will work as intended. And to me, looking at this from, from the social science perspective, it's, it's, there's nothing about it that's credible. Missy? And I also don't buy the intent, so. Um, and in my opinion, when we look to the provincial definition set up by the commissions, we are enshrining the theory of a gender spectrum into the law. I wonder if you can comment on that. That's exactly what we're doing. We're in, and I think, I think that that might even be more dangerous than, in my opinion, than the compelled speech issue. Because the social constructionist view of gender isn't another opinion, it's just wrong. So, because, and I can, I can tell you why that is fairly, I'll, I'll take one minute to do that. Please. Well, the proposition that's in, instantiated, for example, in this, in this particular visual, which is a good representation of the, of the philosophy of the policies, is that there's no causal relationship between the, these four dimensions of identity, and, and that's palpably absurd. I mean, 98% of people, it's 99.7% of people who inhabit a body with a given biological sex identify with that biological sex. It's, it's, they're t incredibly tightly linked. If, if you can't uh, attribute causality to a link that that's tight, that's that tight, you have to dispense with the notion of causality altogether. And then of the people who, who identify, say, as male or female, who are also biologically male or female, the vast majority of them have the sexual preference that would go along with that, and the gender identity, and the gender expression. These, these levels of analysis are unbelievably tightly linked, and the, the evidence that biological factors play a role in determining gender identity is, in a word, overwhelming. There isn't a serious scientist alive who would dispute that. Now, you get, you get disputes about it, but they always stem from essentially from the humanities. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I've looked at it very carefully. 
those arguments are entirely ideologically driven. It's a tenant of the ideology that identity is socially constructed. And that's partly why it's been instantiated into law. Because there's no way they're going to win the argument. But they can certainly win, let's say, the propaganda war, especially by foisting this sort of reprehensible uh, advertising information on children. And that's part, of the, that's part of the express intent. I would add. So how do you react to that uh, okay. well, I way make, of perception? I want to make sure I understand your question properly. So when, when the justice said this, was he implying that uh, the identity is not fixed but it is changing and that identity wasn't innate and it was contextual or was he outlining the, 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 the arena within which this debate might take place? No, it was essentially, it was, you know, it was not a speech on this essentially, it was more if I can use an expression that Mr. Brown will understand, it was rather an obiter, you know, in a conference. The conference was about identity, but of course uh, since, uh, you know, identity is a uh, topic of common and you know yeah. not common debates in Canada he felt that uh, it was helpful if he would you know I should say put his grain of salt in the in the in the public debate by establishing what he thinks is you know how to define transgender identity and establish some parameters okay so let's let's assume that it is changing and contextual yeah okay then why is conversion therapy a problem hmm. See, this is what, see, the thing is, is that when I started opposing this bill, people immediately assumed that I was transphobic and racist and all these other epithets that they're perfectly willing to trot forth at a moment's notice. But, you know, there's been a tremendous attempt to make conversion therapy for people who are gay illegal, right? And the proposition is predicated on the idea that the identity, the sexual preference identity is not changing nor contextual. Mm -hmm. It's fundamental and really what that means is that it's grounded in something like biology. It's okay, fine, let's scrap that, okay? Now it's going to be changing and contextual. Mm -hmm. Okay, then why can't it be changed with context? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so but this is part of the problem with the policies is they're so incoherent that they're going to work against the people that they're designed to protect. Mm -hmm. Now people have a hard time believing I care about that, but you know, the fact that I've been called things doesn't mean that that's what I am. Mm -hmm. So you know, a lot of people who have, let's call it a non-standard identity, the, the tightest argument they have for public acceptance of that identity is that it's powerfully constrained by biological processes that are beyond their voluntary control. So instantiate this view of humanity, the social constructionist view of humanity, and you can wave those claims goodbye because they're completely, um, they, they are at complete odds with the social constructionist viewpoint. And I think that's a big mistake. And I, I really do believe that that will backfire hard against the people who this legislation is designed to protect. Mm -hmm. If it's mutable, changeable, only subjective and, and transformable on a whim, then why should anyone have any respect for it?